God is the one perfect life flowing through us. God is the one pure substance out of which our organism is formed. God is the only reality of us. All else is but shadow cast by some foolish belief or unwise combination of thoughts. When we let light flood us with its sunshine, all clouds vanish, and we begin to see ourselves in new ways that lead us to wholeness and health and spiritual growth. Those are the words of our co-founder, Myrtle Fillmore, shaping a little bit of her description of God. These some, somehow undescribable, but we still try our best, don't we? Our first unity principle is this, the nature of God, the very essence of God. What is God to us? And, and this one presence, this one power, this all-loving goodness of God is what we've sort of whittled it down to in one sentence, but you know, it can't be limited like that. In short form, we just say God is dot, 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 and leave it wide open. So when you think of God, what comes to mind for you? Do you think of maybe a God as like a fatherly God in the sky? Even though you might have left that belief behind, you might still carry that imagery with you as your God. Do you refer to God as male or female? That kind of tells you how you think of God, if you say he or she, or do you say it, or do you use both interchangeably? Do you think of God more like an essence, or maybe you think it's non-existence? Maybe you think it doesn't exist at all, or that we humans created it so we could have a little bit of comfort. Or maybe you think that God is a friend or a beloved, Maybe you think of God more like principle or energy, the permeation of goodness, or the essence of love, as we just heard in the meditation. Pure potential, intelligence of the universe, it goes on and on and on, doesn't it? Some of us cringe even hearing the term God. I'm using it today because it's a traditional term, and it's one that we grew up with. And today, I want to look at shaking out some of those limiting beliefs. Generally, personally, I like to use terms like the divine or spirit because it separates me from the limiting ideas of God. <laughs> but today, it feels like the right term to use as we speak about this first principle. If I had one wish for the world, it would be for all adults to re-examine their view of God at least once per decade. That's the opening sentence of the book, The Five Principles by Reverend Ellen Devonport. That we would examine, and I, I join Ellen in imploring us to do that, to, to look to see what is our grown-up God, and how might we be carrying the vestiges of a child hood God that isn't really serving us anymore. You know, some of us has den have denounced our beliefs completely in something beyond us, beyond physical life. It just ends there at the grave. And some of us have rejected religion wholesale, you know, and just still others of us are on this spiritual journey continuously, but we haven't really stopped to consider if our God has evolved along with us, if our concept and understanding, and it's important to do so, it's worthy of our consideration, because it's that belief that we stand on, it's that practice that we have that nurtures us day after day after day. It's how we navigate life when the ride gets bumpy, and boy, have we been in some bumpy rides in the last year. So having this sense of what I believe and what I hang on to and how I practice and how that shows up when, when life gets tough. What do I reach for? How do I feel safe? So images make great impressions on our consciousness. You know, the, the saying, I think I said it last week, and it's, it's so true, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. There is that imagery, and we are a very increasingly visual society. 
But even way back when, you know, we had images and images that we've made and replicated over and over again through our lifetimes. Especially those that we have seen over and over again really make an impression on our consciousness. For example, this one. This is the creation of Adam. It is a painting in, uh, that by Michelangelo on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican in, in Italy. I've stood below this painting and you know you have to crane your neck all the way up to see it and just stood sort of agape at the beauty of this amazing painting. This is only a portion of it, but it's the portion that has been replicated. It, it's one of the most replicated paintings of all time. It might be the most replicated paintings. So if you haven't been there, you've probably seen the image, you know it well. The painting is meant to show us how God created us in, in God's own image. And, of course, it doesn't really come as much surprise to many of us that the image is an older white male with a flowing beard reaching to create the first human, a younger white male receiving and becoming creation. That exclusive limiting image has been passed down for centuries, impressed upon us again and again and again. If you happen to be female or a person of color, well, you're kind of out of luck. You don't fit in the paradigm of either the divine or the human when we get this, this um, repetitive imagery for ourselves. And God and Adam's fingers, this may be most important of all, don't touch. It seems like a small gap. I even zoomed in <laughs> the picture we showed you. And it seems like a small gap, but in that gap is the greatest lie of all. It's an intentional gap to show that there is separation between God and humanity, that the two, maybe forever, will not connect. And we know that that is not the truth. I'm sorry if I've ruined this painting for you. I love it. I love the Sistine Chapel. If we can just appreciate it for what it is, a viewpoint, a snapshot, and not let it be the thing that has carried us in, in the DNA of ourselves as that kind of imagery. And we may say, oh yeah, I long left that kind of idea behind with my childhood. But you know, when the going gets rough, that's when we see <laughs> what we really believe, what we really reach for, how we practice, and how we think of and image God and speak about God. All of it is worthy of our consideration. If we follow the trajectory of the Bible, this Judeo-Christian story gives us an evolutionary story of our understanding, our spiritual maturation and understanding of who this God is and how the God itself evolves with us out of our own mental understanding and projection and belief system, deeper than mental, our emotional and our spiritual understanding most of all. So if you look at the early books of, of uh, sometimes called the Old Testament, now we tend to call it the Hebrew Scriptures, in, in those early books, you can kind of collectively say that in general, God is pretty absent, right? God, is, God speaks to and through people, but he's generally he is, is seen as he, and and away from. We, you know, in the early stages, we're practicing this sort of uh, absent father, who when father shows up, it's kind of like, uh-oh. You know, it's, it's not always like a warm and fuzzy feeling. In fact, a lot of times, it's this punishing God. God is sort of seen as like a father time, right? And we are punished for not doing it right or at the right time or showing up at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing, essentially. And, and sometimes we show up at the right time and we do the right thing or we just happen to be in the right place at the right time and, and there's a reward of some kind. But that punishment really sticks with us, right? That kind of, of God. In, in, that, um, in those scriptures, we learn that God is jealous. And if we so much as have this idea of an image or a face of God that is um, 
different fr from the one that maybe we should have, <laughs> then there is, you know, some, some, so to speak, hell to pay. And so there's, there's a sense of, you know, well, the frogs will come, the famine will come, the plagues of all these things will come, right? The locusts will come upon us. And that's what happens over and over again in these stories. So no wonder it is that some people, you know, don't really want to open up those books. Of course, in Unity, we understand those stories to be um, not just metaphors, but a term we use, metaphysical, there's beyond the physical, there's something there for us to call forth. We're not going to get into that today because we're really about this evolutionary idea, this spiritual maturation that we're going through and, and hoping, my hope is, my, my desire is that, that our, our, um, that impression in us, that, that mental, emotional, and spiritual understanding is tracking along with us as we evolve on our spiritual journey. And if we don't stop and reflect once in a while, we have no way of really knowing until things get tough. And then we might notice where we go and how we think and how we reach out. So um, it, in the, the story um, that goes on from there, the next big event that I would say in terms of this evolution of God is when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai and he spends 40 days and 40 nights there. And he comes down with not only, as, as we've seen in the movies, you know, this big sweeping drama of the two stone tablets that have the Ten Commandments on it. That's known as the covenant that we have with God. So, so we follow these laws and we will be watched over. We will be taken care of. That's the covenant that has made the agreement, the sacred agreement. And Moses also receives very specific specifications to build an ark that will contain the covenant. And so the nomadic Israelites from there on, after building that ark and placing the covenant in the ark, are carrying around not only the ark of the covenant, which is what it's called, but we have moved now to the very presence of God being carried with us, much nearer than that absent God. It's sometimes called the Ark of God. So there is a sense of wherever the covenant is, as the nomads move about, when they place the covenant down, there's a sense of there is God. And so here we are now closer to it, carrying it with us. It moves beside us. It's with us, but it's not... It's not super close yet, right? That gap between the fingers is still pretty large. But there is movement. The, the narrative, though, the, another part of this exclusive narrative that, that continues is that, you know, if, if God is not, um, if we are the people who have God and God is in here, then we're the only one who have God, right? So there's this exclusiveness that continues in the story that we've got God and nobody else does, um, that we see played out today in, in um, some of the evangelical ideas of, you know, if you, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have God, but that's a little further down the line. So here we are in this place God is sort of in a box, right? And that's a really great metaphor for ways that we have kept our God limited and exclusive in a box. And so yet what's happening in our evolution here in the snapshot of this time of the Ark of the Covenant is we have moved closer. And that's a really important part of our evolution. God is nearer to us. God moves with us. God is beside us and much closer than God was just a few chapters or verses before. Here's another thing about the ark. If we've lost the ark, we've lost God. And so it's kind of, it sounds a little absurd when we say it that way, but it's not that much unlike how we are now. You know, I don't know if any of you feel like, well, I can't go to unity anymore, so I've sort of lost God. I mean, I hope nobody thinks it that way, that way, and I doubt any of you do, but there might be a part of you that feels a depth of loss beyond the sense of the depth of, of um, a different kind of connection with our community now, because it's not physical, it's not in person, and so there's not that sort of reinforcement. But we do this a lot, you know, I think, in our minds at least, if we aren't actively practicing, meditating, praying, or doing what we do to feel that connection, we might feel like God left. 
God's absent. If I'm not in the midst of practice, I'm not sure where God is. And it's that realization, that knowing that sometimes we do that to recognize God never leaves. We leave. (laughs) Our attention leaves. Our attention strays. And there's a lot to get distracted with. But within an instant, we can move our attention back to the truth and stand on the principles that we know. You know, I'm going to get into a little bit of the events of the week, but I I can't help but speak to those now because it's in these kinds of times that what we need is our faith. What we need is what we stand on. What we need is our principles. Not not to take problems and issues and fears and and try to, um, as Einstein said, you know, solve it at the level of the problem. That doesn't work. Combat facing combat, you know, uh, riot facing riot, that, that doesn't work for us. As spiritual beings, there's something far greater. Violence does not help us, you know, taking violence and violence together. We know how that goes, right? We know how that story ends. We've done it over and over and over again in our history. And so in the, you know, as we think about this ark, it represents so much more. The the archaeologists keep digging for it. They haven't found that ark of the covenant yet, but they keep on looking in various places. So no one has actually found the actual ark, but like archaeologists of the spirit, we keep digging for the one true God. And our spiritual journey is about never stopping, not just getting smug and saying, well, Now I've got this, you know, this basic outline, these basic guiding principles, so that's that. No, the principles are just alive with with the fifth principle, which is acting it, right? Living it, being it, day after day after day, growing into the truth of what this lays out for us. They're not static. They never were meant to be static. So as we evolve then, we, we became... God itself became flesh, right? That was the beginning of the New Testament, that we came into, or the Christian scriptures, that, that, we, that we, a human being was actually uh, God-like or of God or made of God, God itself in human form. And so, of course, we called this person Jesus. And he then became a savior through which we only had access to the divine if we were accessing that the divine through this physical presence of God known as Jesus, the one begotten son. Now that's the narrative that a lot of mainstream and evangelical Christians would tell us. But in unity and new thought, we take it a different place. We hear the teachings of Jesus saying, you know, God is in you too. Did I not say ye are gods? He echoes the Hebrew tra- chapters, you know, this idea that, that this is carried forward, that the second coming of Christ is not Jesus physically coming again, but the realization of the indwelling presence. That's our second principle in unity, and we're going to look at that a little bit more next week. But the question I want to go back to is when we have arrived at the second principle, does it negate the first one? Does it mean we don't any longer need the first one? If we are God, if I am the divine, then Do we really need the allness of God? Do we need any kind of God that is bigger than us? I do. And let's take a look to see if maybe you do too. When I was a new minister at Unity of Columbia in Missouri, a faculty member from the Unity Institute, uh, we called it something else then, but it doesn't matter, it's now called the Unity Institute, and he came and he gave a rousing talk and a workshop, and we were all afire with this, this sense of we are God, right? It's one and the same, so, so why do we keep separating out? You know, it's just we are God. That's it, right? That's, that's what we know ourselves to be. We were so inspired by that and stretched, we thought spiritually by that, that uh, decided to make a quick and bold move on one of our blessings to really own that. And somebody in the congregation came up to me and said, I still need a God that's bigger than me. And when she said that, I realized that I do too. And maybe we all do. The principle one is not negated by principle two, but the two live inside of one another. 
And that this idea that God is us, but that we, and, and that God is still so much more than us, is really key. That we live inside of the heart of God just as God lives in the heart of us. As God speaks in the Hindu scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, he says, or she says, or it says, by me, this entire universe is pervaded. All things are in me, and I in them. It's a both and. So the events of the week, as we return to those, the violence in the capital, the impressions that were given to us through, if you watched news at all, you, you saw visual impressions that are in your now impressed in your heart and mind too. And so that's this sense as we maybe take a moment to breathe this truth that not only is God in us, but we are also in God, that there is a bigger something at work that there is a bigger something to reach for in the universe, that there is something else inclusive of us, and yet a bigger energy moving through the people and the places that are meaningful to us. When so many things feel out of control, when this happens in the context of so many things that have felt out of our control, a pandemic, you know, uh, our government, the effects on our sense of well-being, all these things that we thought we could count on before, our health, uh, you know, a, a sense of robustness and vitality that we still can count on, but sometimes day after day when you're putting on those masks and doing the physical distancing and washing your hands, it can feel like something's amiss here, right? And after a while, it gets wearing. When our connection on one another, it, with one another, is, it feels different and it just it gets a little tiring. You know, it's great. We've got Zoom and we've got all these ways to connect with one another, but there's nothing like that physical presence. And these are, these are realities of our grief. To let it be, to let, it, let the grief be and to realize, you know, I've got the power within me, but I've got power bigger than that. We all do. A universal power that we can also lean on and rest in and know that that heartbeat of God is at work. And then, you know, this, this um, finally, this, this sense of what is sacred to us, right? The U.S. Constitution is a covenant that we have for how, how, who we are as a people in our country. The Capitol is a symbol of that, a symbol of democracy, something that we have leaned on and, re and recognized as who we are collectively, partisanship aside. So to have those kinds of foundations all shaking at the same time, this is big stuff going on here. But here's what we know as spiritual people, that the awakening continues. You know, on the burning bowl, we had the phoenix rising out of the ashes, right? And it may not feel like that. And I know I keep saying that Sunday after Sunday, something bigger is happening here. And it's just, we're, we're not through it yet, obviously. And sometimes it takes really obvious physical things being broken open, like the Capitol, and violence being done there, and Confederate flags flying through that space for us to go, oh, wow, I see it in reality, in real time, that stuff is sort of breaking apart in order for the rebirth to happen. That's what we need to hang on to. That's the truth that is coming through. We just can't see the whole thing because we aren't the allness of God. We are an important part of God, but there is more beyond that for us to lean on. I especially lean on God in situations in life that seem beyond my control to affect. You know, like the adage, the, the, the really great 
kind of rule of law or, or guideline, I should say, that, that we tend to, to follow in relationships and organizations is you go to the one in charge, right? You go to the one who can make the change. All the gossip and all the triangulation really isn't healthy. But if you need a change, if you're not happy, you go to the one who can make the change. That's what happens in healthy families. That's what happens in healthy organizations. That's what help, happens in any healthy relationship. And a lot of us, you know, don't feel comfortable, and so we create all this other soup, right? But knowing that, then we can know that the one in charge, the one that, that well, of course, we are the ones who can make change, you know, ultimately because, because of the physicality, too. So this is, again, where, you know, principles one and two sort of intermix with one another. But to know that worldly leadership at times is going to fail us. Human leadership at times is going to fall short. But divine leadership, visionary leadership, it never fails us. When we return to the vision of the truth of who we are and how we are in the context of this thing we call God, there are no mistakes. And that we can lean on, that we can hold as truth. That faith is more important right now than maybe anything to be able to ground ourselves in that. It's all playing out in real time now. And so we just have to keep remembering to breathe, to speak some kind of truth that really resonates for us. God is in me and I am in God. Maybe that's it. And to just repeat that, to know that, that there is a, a presence and a power that permeates this universe. And that that presence and that power is at work in every situation that disturbs my soul. So what is God? I want to encourage you to keep looking at that because every one of us will answer that question a little bit differently in our own words. And, and it will be answered hopefully differently at different times. The big three for me for God is a presence, a wisdom, and a love. That presence, that essence it, that I know is in me and is all around me that is permeating everything, that brings me a sense of, of peace and it feels true for me. It resonates as truth in my heart. And that wisdom, that wisdom is, is at work in all of us and including in me. So guidance will be given when guidance is needed. Action will be taken according to that guidance when it is needed. And most of all, for me, it's that love. It's that love that we can just sort of sink into and know that it is in our hearts and that we are in that heart of God, that it is that ever-present love that brings us not only comfort, but also a kind of fierce sense of power and, and knowing what is right and true for us. And that's part of love and wisdom in its... In its um, partnership. So the Ark of the Covenant in biblical times stopped moving when the nomadic Israelites found home. And King David, as the story goes, is attributed with having brought that Ark of the Covenant into what is the representation of the center, the spiritual center, into the heart of of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, rep is a representation of going home, going home to that center within us. And so the Ark of the Covenant was symbolically placed there. So knowing then that we live in the heart of God and God lives in the heart of, God, of us, that's oneness. That's that what we mean by oneness. Oneness doesn't mean it stops at the boundary of me or that it is exclusive to the boundary of me, which is kind of the old way of thinking. God includes everything but me, everything but humans. And then if we, we reverse it and we become like overly um, uh, exuberant and enthusiastic about principle number two, we can get to the point, well, I'm God and that's it, you know, that's the end of it. But it doesn't end there either. You know, there isn't really that separation. It's that permeation of the presence. That's really, um, in my mind, what's a key understanding in our evolution. We are not separate. We are not being watched. There is no finger coming down from the heavens just apart from ours, leaving a gap. Instead, we are immersed in the divine like a fish in water. 
And the, the, the fish opens it, gill, its gills, right? And the water just permeates through. The water is the fish. The fish is made of the water, and the fish is swimming in the water. And we often use that analogy to say sometimes the fish has no idea it's swimming in water because it's all it's ever known. And sometimes we forget with our intelligent capacity as humans and our physical life, we place the truth out there. That's not the truth. We place our power in the, the human leadership that sometimes fails us. That's not the end of the power. And so it's a recognition, ah, it's everywhere. We're swimming in it. The power, the presence, the love, the wisdom, everything that we need is right here, out here and in here. But most of all, we need to know it in here and in here in order to act accordingly. So our coming to this realization, it's joyful when we recognize, right? When we have that sort of, oh, right, I know this truth, it dawns on us and it opens up our heart and it makes us want to sing and testify. So let's take a moment to listen and maybe sing along with Love Eternal. Aloha. I'm going to play a song for you called Here to Pray. It's not a spot where God is not this is not just a thought, but the truth on which I stand. Angels work through our own hands. We are here to pray, we are here to pray, we are here to pray.
get to pray. Love you guys. Aloha. So what is your God now in 2021? And what covenant would you make with your God? Maybe it has something to do with your white stone. You could consider that word and name and see if maybe that has something to do with your covenant for right now and going into the new year and maybe beyond that. I hope most of all that you'll reflect on these kinds of questions that we'll, we can live into them together in the new year. That we'll allow our concept of God to evolve with us as we spiritually evolve. And that alone frees us to become more of the truth of who we are. So let's close out with this affirmation, with this knowing that these two are dancing together, our God and our own evolution. Let's speak it together. My God evolves as I spiritually mature, freeing me to become more. And so it is. Mm -hmm.